Hello and welcome to our new interview series, Northern Slant Hosts. My name is Roger Greer, contributor at Northern Slant and host of the new series. And today we're welcomed by someone who's been involved in politics, the political process, policy and public affairs across Ireland for many years. Has been at times Director of Communications for the SDLP, a special advisor, an MLA, and now Chief Executive of the PR and Public Affairs firm Hume Brophy. Colin McDevitt, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Roger. Um, I was reading a piece which you'd written for the British Council um, and their lives entwined magazine in 2019. Um, and you say that when school, when school kids used to come up to Stormont, um, you'd give them the tour. And one of the questions which you would ask them was, who are you? Um, as in, are you British, Irish, Northern Irish? And you speak about identity in quite, it's, it's quite a fluid term. Mm -hmm. There's not too many have, who have had a diverse identity in past as you, such as yourself, you know, raised in Dublin, spent a lot of time in Spain and Northern Ireland. Um, how would you answer that question which you posed to so many kids way back when? And how did that past get you involved in politics, in particular the SDLP? How do I answer the identity, the question about my own identity, Roger? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I was born in Dublin. Uh, at <clears throat> age nine and a half, we went to Spain, to the south of Spain to Malaga, to Andalusia, and I didn't set foot in Ireland until I was an, a man, until I was 19. So it taught me a lot about, about who you are. I'm an immigrant. I, I have walked in the shoes of a child immigrant, like many, unfortunately, across this continent and across the world in, in the past decade. Uh, so therefore, I'm Irish. There's no question about that. I am I'm a true blue Hill 16 dub. <laughs> and uh, with apologies to everyone on the northern slant, I'm obviously delighted that only this past weekend it became a six in a row. For the I was going to say you should be happy this weekend. Uh. I am exceptionally happy. Four in a row for the women yesterday, and it couldn't be better for Dublin, for Dublin football at the moment. But that sense of my identity is rooted in the first nine years of my life. That's where it comes from. It comes from playing for St. Sylvester's in Malahide as a little nipper in under 10s. Then I go to Spain and uh, I arrive in Spain in 1982 at the emergence of the Spanish democratic era. I become part by accident, uh, happenstance of what's known as the transition generation in Spain, the generation of people who were children in that transfer of power from dictatorship to democracy. And I suppose are the people who are building the modern Spain. I'm the same age as the current prime minister, for example, and so on and so forth. But I arrived in a particular part of Spain. It's called Andalusia. It's in the south. Most people here just know because they go on their holidays there because that's where the Costa del Sol is. But Andalusia is a place apart. For 700 years, it was part of a Moorish empire, one of the greatest empires in the world. It has got one foot in the Muslim world and one foot in the Christian world. It is the bridgehead between two great civilizations, uh, two great faiths. And so therefore there is a big part of me that is Andalus. I speak the language, I speak it with the accent, I was educated in the language. I am the product of their system. They shaped me. I think, still do my math in Spanish, for example. Um, and then as an adult, I returned here to Ireland and uh, by happenstance had the opportunity to come work for the SDLP and to move to Belfast. There's a nice side story that says my family were from Belfast originally, but was that relevant? No. I think the most relevant thing was the opportunity to be part of the John Hume project, to be part of Hume and to be part of the vision and to be part of the dream. And so I became a northerner by choice. And I am very proud uh, to be a northerner by choice. I'm still a dub. And if you get me talking about football, soccer, that is, <laughs> I'm still from Malaga and an Andalou. And so my life experience of identity is that it is not binary. And, you know, we, we live in this, this, this era where we're able to talk very openly and honestly about all sorts of other aspects of identity, sexual identity, gender identity, so on and so forth. And I, I believe uh, national and regional identities are equally as fluid. And I believe that one of the greatest and most empowering things any of us can do is to just understand the complexity and the, the richness of your own identity and to celebrate it. So, yeah. I am both Irish and Northern, but when I'm here, I'm clearly a Mexican because that's the way you Nordies like to talk about us Southerners. <laughs> whilst I'm one of you, I'm not. 
I am absolutely Andalusian and proud of it. I, I am a Spanish Unionist, Roger, in that I believe in the integrity of the 1978 constitution in Spain, which means that my political ideologies in terms of nationalism are contrary, contradictory in terms of it. When I see it through a Spanish lens or I see it through an Irish lens, because what yeah. the Irish person in me would love to see New Ireland, the Spanish in me does not want to see Catalonia go independent. Yeah. And people say, well, how can you be all those things? Well, of course you can, because life is just a wonderful, beautiful series of rich questions and contradictions. And those of us who, who live it to the fullest are just those of us who are able to get our heads around all those contradictions and turn them into liberating things rather than prisons for ourselves. Yeah, and you turned a number of those contradictions in that, that journey into uh, become the director of uh, Commons for the SDLP during that uh, the Good Friday Agreement negotiations and uh, following that as bad. A challenging but rewarding time to be involved in politics in Northern Ireland? Uh, hugely so. I mean, being director of communications during the Good Friday process uh, was, I mean, the highlight of, of the career. You know, you feel like you've feel like you had a premiership soccer career without ever been half good at soccer you know but it peaked when you were 25 <laughs> um it was it was the most special moment in our history you know i i will i will never ever 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 lose the feeling of history of um momentousness that w that was present around that time and i wish we could recapture some of that spirit today being in the first executive was also a wonderful experience. It wasn't without its challenges, like government is difficult. Right? That's, yeah. As Churchill said about democracy, you know, the worst form of government, except for all the alternatives. Uh, and it's meant to be difficult. It's meant to be hard and challenging. But you know, that first executive did, did great work. It laid the foundations for a, uh, for a new Northern Ireland. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, those foundations remain pretty solid despite everything, you know. Uh, it, uh, it certainly showed that power sharing can work, even though it's the most challenging form of democratic government that you would ever have to try and work. It can work. And it dealt with certain crises very well. Foot and mouth was on my watch and in the department that Breed Rogers, my minister, led. And it became an example of how when this region puts its own interests first, above everything else, uh, it understands that the people who elect it are the people of Northern Ireland. And that's where the book stops. And that's where uh, the interest must also uh, be first put. Uh, when it does that, it can achieve pretty good things and it can achieve great results uh, for everyone. Yeah. And I think that's the great lesson for me from the Good Friday Agreement process and from the first executive is that this region is a region. It's a matter of fact. And uh, in order for its people to flourish, it must succeed as such irrespective of what constitutional framework it may be operating within. Yeah, and um, you were dragged to the, to the, the front line of, of politics then in 2010. Um, my abiding memory of you as an MLA, because <clears throat> I worked at the assembly at the time, was, I think it was a, a same-sex marriage debate, um, and I was in the public gallery watching, and you just made a speech. And I think it was, a I can't remember uh, which one, but it was a DUP member who was... Um, given their speech and from a sedentary position um you were i think challenging every point that could have been made um you were heckling um and there weren't too many mlas at that time who got that political theater who were able to do that bit of the of the parliamentary job it, it all seemed to for many of them in, in any case reading a speech from the press office not too many meaningful interventions um but you seem to thrive on that um did you enjoy that aspect of the job and how what dragged when you what dragged you back into to politics and to become an MLA? Um well, first of all, being an MLA was the greatest honor of my life. There's no question about that. Being given the opportunity to serve your community um, is, is a wonderful thing. But also being given the 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 responsibility and the power to make the law. Uh, to be uh, one of the very few who have the opportunity to shape the future by laying down statute. And central to making good law is open, honest discourse, it's debate. It is being able to fundamentally disagree with somebody openly and honestly. And so the debating chamber of any assembly, any parliament, but particularly Stormont, must be a place where honest and open debate can, can happen. 
And therefore, I always felt it was my duty to debate when I was in that chamber, not to make statements, but to debate. And um, I don't remember that particular uh, exchange, <laughs> um, but I do remember many exchanges where it, there were fundamental disagreements across the floor. And the few that would debate uh, were also the few who made the greatest contribution to moving society on. Uh, I felt very strongly about same-sex marriage way before very many people in this region did. And, and I was willing to stand up for it because it is just core to who I am as a human being. And I expected to be able to say my piece and to be heard. And I had no problem people heckling me or intervening or challenging me on every single point, as long as they would respect my right to do so in return. Um, and so for me, though, th those few years in the assembly, you know, were years where I felt there was an urgency to make change, whether it was by promoting, I suppose, a liberal agenda that I would be, I guess, perceived to be to be very much supportive of, or whether it was campaigning for, for people who, who had been voiceless for many decades, most notably the victims of historic institutional abuse in this region. And the thing I'm probably most proud of, and you know, during my tenure in the assembly is the role I play in getting that inquiry off the ground. And, and having their voice heard, because that's what assemblies are about. They are about bringing, they're about shining lights in dark corners, they're about holding people to account, holding society to account, and they're about moving us forward through discourse, through disagreement, because in order to get to agreement, you have to first go through the phase of disagreement. And the place to work those things through is both the main chamber and the committees in Stormont. So yeah, it was the job and it was a great privilege and a great honor to do it. Yeah, someone said that, um... The parliamentary chambers, the politics of theatre, and the uh, the committees or parliament at work. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I I, I disagree. That a little bit. I challenge that a little bit. I think it's it committee work is detail work. Uh, yeah. When you're able to, you know, you're able to consider stuff in detail, and it's really important. But any great argument, societal argument, has to stand up to the, you know, to the to the old bar stool test, if you if you if you don't mind me putting it yeah. that way. It has to stand up to four people who sit on a Friday evening to meet up, to have a chat about things, being able to understand the debate and get the issues and project them back amongst each other. And they'll have got that from parliamentary exchanges because that's the synthesis. You have to be able to reduce it to its ess essence. And that's what par parliamentary debate forces you to do. And yes, there, there is theatre with it, obviously, uh, but in or it, the theatre is necessary to engage to get people excited and interested and thinking about what's going on and the debates that are taking place in their name. Yeah, certainly. And then in, in 2013, um, you stepped down as an MLA um, in relation to your transition from the private sector to mm. uh, an MLA. And I mean, two things struck me at that time about it. First, it seemed to be, it seemed an act of swift integrity in a place that had, and I suppose has since enjoyed an ability to act without um, and working I worked uh, with the Ulster Unionist Party at the time. I suppose I was just happy we weren't on the front pages um, for a, a day or two. But also, despite working for the Ulster Unionist Party, I was sad to see you go. And I thought it was quite a, a loss to the to politics and, and particularly politics in the chamber. Given what many before and I suppose since have done and lived through politically, do you look back at it and think what might have been if you'd have stuck around? No. No. Um, no, I was, I fell below the standards expected of someone with the great privilege of holding the office I held. And I am very acutely aware that we are still in the early stages of, of our process of reconciliation, of our process of region building here in Northern Ireland. And I'm very, very acutely aware of the precedents we must all set. So I'm afraid I don't regret having to take the decision I took. I regret deeply ending up in that situation. Yeah. Like I, you know, I've, I've laid awake many nights, you know, asking myself why I was so incompetent, frankly, you know, in, in, in that aspect of my, uh, of my uh, duty of care uh, to myself and to my constituents and to my party and to my family, my colleagues, but I was. And when you make a mistake on something like that, you have to hold yourself accountable. You cannot, go into a committee and hold public servants or ministers accountable if you're not willing to put yourself under the same level of scrutiny. And I also believe um, for what it's worth that none of us 
should see politics as a career. It's not. It's not a career. It, it is a vocation that, you know, is within you and that you, you will likely have your entire life. But the privilege of serving in a parliament or holding high office is that it is a privilege. And you are serving. You are serving. And you are serving with all sorts of conditions uh, and all sorts of constraints. And whenever you compromise those conditions or constraints, the first point of responsibility must be oneself. And so, no, I don't regret for a second what I did. I, I, I can sleep at night because of what I did. And, and I thank you for your, your kind words, Roger. One of, the, one of the most affirming things about my decision was what happened in the weeks after. There's, I think we counted them one day, there are nearly a thousand letters in a bag upstairs, uh, which came in from people from around here, around, around my part of town and, and, and around these islands, just to say thank you. And I'd rather have done that and be thanked for a good service and for having taken responsibility when I fell below the standards than to have stayed and never have had the moral integrity to be able to make the change that I believed in. Yeah, I mean, I've spoken to an MP um, from England who he, he served one term, I think he lost the seat in 2017, um, and now runs a think tank uh, in London. And he claims that he has more influence and more ability to actually make change now that he um, runs a think tank than he did as a backbench uh, MP. Do you feel like, I mean, Hume Brophy is, works across the UK and Ireland, uh, EU, Singapore as well, possibly, yeah? Yeah, yeah, Hong Kong, yeah, it's got a, a global reach. Um, do you get more done now than you did as an MLA? Well, not politically, no. I mean, yeah. um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's difficult when you're backbench in Westminster because it's such a huge parliament, uh, and you'll know now from your day job, Roger. Like it's a massive parliament; it's very easy to be to be lost in it. But somewhere like the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, every MLA has a huge amount of influence or power if they if they just figure out how to use it. If you know what I mean, yeah, if they yeah. figure out how to use the system, uh, and that's true in Scotland as well. So devolved administrations are very powerful places, and people who have the opportunity to serve in devolved administrations have a lot more power than a lot of people who sit in Westminster yeah. and just never, for whatever reason, are never able to serve in high offices of state. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with with that MP. I mean, uh, I, I run a business. We have the great privilege of representing commercial, state, non governmental organisations around the world, not just in the public affairs space and the public relations space. It's fascinating work. You get to be involved in some of the most interesting global debates of, of, of our era. And you get to, you know, remain very actively involved in these big conversations, but you are, you are just a service provider uh, and you are not a political agent. Uh, and I am very clear about that. And, and everyone who works for me is very clear about that. If you want to become a political agent, uh, everyone in our organization is free to be actively involved in politics. We obviously have no problem with that. Uh, and if I wish to become a political agent again, I would re-engage and put my name on a ballot paper and, 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 and get, a, you know, get back on the pitch. What I do today is fascinating. And for anyone who's a political junkie uh, uh, and doesn't sure want to be in elected office, I, it's a great career. It's a, it's a wonderful privilege. I mean, I've, we're speaking in the middle of the morning here. I had a few calls with Asia this morning talking about stuff uh, that's going down on that side of the world, really fascinating, interesting things. Um, talking about the Australian election coming up next year and some of the issues that may or may not come to the fore. Uh, you know, that's like being let loose in the, in the, in, in, in the chocolate shop when you're a bit of a junkie. And it's very, very, very rewarding, obviously, from a career point of view as well. Uh, yeah, and you say that you, if you were tempted to put your name back on the ballot paper again, could you be tempted back into politics again um, anywhere in Ireland? Uh, at this moment in time, no. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have a we have a we have a job of work to do uh, here with our teams. We're building a company with the largest independent consultancy in what we do. Uh, it, it, you know, in Ireland, the first ever global agency of our type to emerge from Ireland. We're very proud of that. There's a there's a, a fair few years of work ahead of us yet, and, and we'll stick at that. I I I I do want Northern Ireland to succeed. I mean, I passionately want Northern Ireland to succeed. Uh, I do not want us to pass up the opportunity to make it a success. I don't believe I am needed or any of my generation are needed to make that happen. Uh, uh, I believe there is a current generation who need to 
share that ambition and share that drive and need to take it and take it forward themselves to be honest with you so so no i mean i've i've, I've ran my race uh and uh that is that uh, in 2011 uh, when you stood for the, the leadership of the, the sdlp you said that you wanted to establish a, a uh, 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 Ireland 2021 campaign um, is this as we says, take our foot, first footsteps in the 2021 is this the 2021 you envisaged at that time Gosh. no no not at all no, it, it, it is not um, I mean my my philosophy has always been that uh, as a new Irelander as someone believes that the only way you can ever bring about true reconciliation on this island and indeed true reconciliation between these islands and therefore unlock the prosperity and opportunity in us all uh, as human beings, as communities, as societies, as economies is through agreement, uh, is through dialogue, is through understanding and respect. As someone who believes in all those things, I am I'm obviously, I'm sure, as disappointed as everyone else that this past decade has shown, shown us very little evidence of any significant progress on the great project of reconciliation, uh, certainly in Northern Ireland across these islands. Um, having said that, we've kept the, kept the kind of show on the road. And that in, in, in of it, and of itself is not a bad thing. It is better to be turning up every day for something, even if it's not working very well, than to have nothing to turn up for. And uh, no, we're not in the 21 I would have wished. The decade of uh, centenaries has not gone the way I would have hoped it to have gone. But we're still in a better place today than we were in 2011. And that is an important thing to remember. Yeah. And the last question that you asked all those school kids back, uh, way back when, was what are your hopes? And I think that summarizes that. You know, we, we have had a difficult decade. Um, we're probably going to go into a difficult 2021 and, and beyond. Um, but what are your hopes for the sort of future past that in the next few years for Northern Ireland? Oh, my hopes are that this region will find its, uh, find, its, find its equilibrium. It will find a way of being able to succeed as a region, whether it's a region within the United Kingdom or a region on the island of Ireland. That is secondary the principal and most important duty of its leaders and the test by which they must be all held accountable is whether they can make it succeed as a region. You'll not be surprised to hear that I consider Brexit to be a great tragedy, but the Northern Ireland Protocol creates huge opportunities economically for enterprising people in this region. And I wish to see them supported to take full advantage of those opportunities. And that means being Northern Irish, and been able to trade as Northern Irish businesses, whether it's through the Republic of Ireland into the European Union or into the United Kingdom through Northern Ireland. And to do that, people need to unlock their minds a little bit uh, and they need to, you know, drop the guard just a tiny bit and stop thinking about, about you know, an identity uh, and start thinking about uh, the one thing that they do, they do have power and agency and control over, which is social policy, economic policy, education policy in this region. And I'm Darwinian. Uh, if, you, if, if you were to ask anyone in Hume Brophy about Connell's approach to uh, leadership, they'd say he believes that organisations have to adapt always, constantly adapt to the changing world around them. This region needs to learn to be a bit Darwinian itself and adapt to the realities that it is, it is within. Brexit's one, COVID and this terrible pandemic is another. But if we can learn to adapt, we also by definition will learn to cooperate and collaborate better. And we will understand that compromise is not a dirty word, but a beautiful, special, wonderful, empowering thing that unlocks that great richness that our diversity should be driving uh, uh, our economy through and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it's going to be tough, but it's all there. It's all there in front of anyone. Just need to start taking advantage of it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you very much for speaking to us. Really, really appreciate it. It's hugely insightful. And it's great to, great to have you join us for, uh, for the series. Um, so thank you very much. Well, thanks, Roger. And thank you for, uh, for thinking of me.
Oh, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, this is one of the first in the in the series of uh, Northern Slant hosts. Uh, do keep an eye out for future interviews in the series. You'll find them on our website uh, and on all of our social media. But uh, in the meantime, Connell, thanks very much for joining us again. Thanks. Happy Christmas. Mm-hmm.